the Baroness and the sorry saga of bungled PPE. In an exclusive interview, Michelle Moan admits she lied about her involvement, yet the problems of the pandemic are not the only hangover from the past. Will 2024 be dominated by the ghosts of what went before? Rishi Sunak managed to win a vote on his Rwanda plan. 269. <laughs> But a fight to win the argument on immigration lurks in the new year. Stopping the boats means stopping the gimmicks. The Prime Minister got through the COVID inquiry unscathed. I did not say those words. I don't recollect anyone saying those words. But the shadow of the well, pandemic does more than linger. Um, I did make an error in saying to the press I wasn't involved. And I regret and I'm sorry. The Baroness caught up in the PPE scandal admits she lied, but claims the whole thing was a shambles. The health service is still struggling with massive backlogs and the winter crisis has arrived. There's no beds. So our main question this morning, will this Christmas be haunted by the past? The couple at the centre of the PPE scandal tell us they did do a deal using her political contacts. They did make tens of millions of pounds, but they say they're scapegoats. The Deputy Prime Minister, Oliver Dowden, is here. What did the government know? Labour has long called for answers over PPE contracts and chaos. The Shadow Health Secretary, Wes Streeting, joins us. But it is nearly Christmas, so we will be all singing and dancing today too. It was the Strictly final last night, and a treat. The great Gregory Porter gives us a Yuletide song. You know what I In your palace warm, mighty king. Morning, morning, and welcome to my panel. Here with me, the actor Brian Cox. He's back. Presenter and journalist Susanna Reid joins us too. And Robert Buckland, Conservative MP, who was in the Cabinet during the COVID crisis. Welcome to you all. First, let's check out today's headlines. The Sunday Times splashes with the Foreign Secretary calling for a sustainable ceasefire in Gaza. That's a definite shift in tone from the government. The Sunday Telegraph has a photograph that's in lots of the papers, Rishi Sunak hugging the Italian Prime Minister, Giorgio Maloney. But its main story is the Prime Minister's warning that hostile states are using immigration to destabilise the West, he claims. The Observer says the winter crisis in the NHS is well on the way and points to the Prime Minister missing his big promises on waiting lists. And the Sunday Mirror splashes with the extraordinary story of Alex Batty, the British teenager found this week after being missing four years. Now then, let's have a bit of a chat about some of these stories. We're going to talk a lot today about Baroness Moan and our interview with her we'll hear in a few minutes. Brian, we found some old images of you meeting her in 2014 during the independence debate when you were on opposite sides. Yes. What do you make of her as a sort of public character? Well, she's certainly... Oh, look... Good God. I can't remember any of that. You don't remember it? <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, yeah, but I'm at that age where I can't even remember why I've walked in a room. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very pleased to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, it's just, um, she's an extraordinary woman, C clearly quite a brilliant entrepreneur, and certainly her bra business was a huge success. I, of course, differ about my, the fate of our country. Um, we have a huge difference about that. I, my feeling is, she said she lied. You don't lie. When you're dealing with something like this, you don't lie, not even tell a little lie, because it just points you in the wrong direction. And it will, if she says, make her a scapegoat, it will make her a scapegoat. She shouldn't tell lies. Well, we'll hear the interview in a few minutes' time. Susanna, you, like many of us, you know, we were covering the story about PPE day after day after day. What do you make of what you've heard so far about what she had to say? I find it absolutely remarkable and why she hasn't been transparent up until this point. And I'm really looking forward to the questions that you put to her. We remember being on air at that time, how desperate care homes were for PPE, 
hospital wards were for PPE. Mm. People were losing their lives because we weren't properly prepared. And I would like to know why people thought that that was an opportunity to then make money out of a national crisis when the care and health sector were on their knees. Robert, you were one of the politicians, though, sitting around the cabinet table mm. during that moment of real crisis, that moment that Susanna's just described. I mean, there was a big scramble and the normal rules were not applied because of that emergency. What was that atmosphere like? And, and maybe did the rules have to be broken by government at that point to say, just get it here? Yeah. Let's first of all remember it was a virtual cabinet table. So there we all were probably in our offices or in our homes trying to govern all of this. Uh, and hence you had all this noise about WhatsApp, etc. But I think there was a huge sense of pressure on all of us to make sure that the public servants in the health service, in the prison service that I was responsible for, were able to work as safely as possible. They were anxious and worried. Their families were frightened and it was incumbent on us to try and make sure that we protected them as much as possible. And there's no doubt that had we kept to the normal procedures, we might well have been far too late to help people. So, so the pressure was on. But to think that anybody wanted to try and make a fast buck out of this is distasteful to say the least and deeply concerning. Well, let's hear what they had to say. Michelle Moan was a hugely successful businesswoman, given the red diamond gown and put in the House of Lords by David Cameron. But she and her husband are perhaps now better known for their part in one of the biggest scandals of the pandemic, billions of pounds of wasted PPE. When COVID hit, Baroness Moan suggested to government ministers that she could help in the scramble for that desperately needed hospital kit, masks and gowns. Then her husband's startup firm, PPE Medpro, secured a deal for £200 million. Their masks were used, but the gowns were bought, then later rejected by the government, saying they weren't up to scratch, and they still sit unused. The couple had denied again and again that they'd had anything to do with the company or its £60 million of profit. But after many months of silence, they now admit that is not true. They face a claim in the court from the Department of Health and a separate investigation by the National Crime Agency. They say their gowns were made according to the contract and that they've been made scapegoats. A couple of days ago, in an exclusive TV interview, they told me their story. There was a call to arms uh, for all Lords, Baronesses, MPs, senior civil servants to help because they needed massive quantities of PPE. Um, given the fact that I've got 25 years manufacturing experience, I looked at Doug and I thought, we can really, really help here. And I just know all the, the key players in the Far East. Um, and I made the call to Michael Gove. And what did you say to him? I just said, we can help and um, we want to help. And he was like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. So we entered into uh, discussions, PP Medpro, myself, um, I led the consortium of two other partners. But you had a kind of VIP access, you know, you had a cabinet minister on speed dial, you could phone up and say, I think I can make this happen. Mm -hmm. Can you put me in touch with the right people? Yeah, well, that's what we were asked to do. Um, but what I think the public think is that, you know, we're trying to keep it a secret that I was involved. Um, everyone in DHSC, NHS, the cabinet office, the government, knew of my involvement and they asked us to both declare our interest. Did you tell the House of Lords authorities? I discussed that with the cabinet office and they said we just need you to put um, it in writing and declare your interest with us. I, I That's all. As well. But the House of Lords rules say that members have a clear duty to provide information which might reasonably be thought by others mm -hmm. to influence their actions. Because there's a question of perception here too. And in fact, the rules also say that sometimes registration of a spouse or a partner's interests is also required. As far as I was aware, if you're not a director, not a shareholder, not financially benefiting, mm -hmm. then that's exactly what I did. If I was told by the cabinet office, no, you actually need to do this, I would have done it straight away. I'm a business guy, so I think like an entrepreneur. I don't know the parliamentary rule book. They must have been satisfied in the end to have awarded the contracts. Contracts, If they were not satisfied, they should never have awarded us the contracts. They should have said, there's a perceived contract here, a conflict here. But what's also clear is the parliamentary rules are clear. Mm -hmm. That members of the House of Lords or members of the House of Commons, if they have a financial interest 
or a perceived conflict of interest, which you mentioned, Doug, the responsibility is on them. It was on you to tell yeah. Parliament. I mean, do you wish you had? Or you just if, if I knew I had to, the Cabinet Office advised me only to do this. By your own admission, though, and for the reasons you set out, you say you wanted to help, but you used your contact with government ministers to help broker a commercial deal for a company that was to bring tens and tens of millions of pounds of profit yeah. for your husband, for your family, and you didn't tell the authorities in Parliament. To a lot of our viewers watching, that might sound like you were trading on your title and not following the rules, not declaring no. it all. No, absolutely not. And I was just acting the same way as every other Baroness Lord who also put names forward. There's lots of us. And how much were you paid and how much of it was profit? So the, the, the two contracts in total came to a value of, uh, of 202 mil million pounds. And uh, you know, MedPro made a, made a return on its investment of about, uh, realistically, about 30%. So about 60 million pounds? Yeah, yeah, about that, yeah, that's right. That's Making a profit of 60 million pounds during a national emergency like a pandemic. Sounds not just like an enormous amount of cash, but also a bit like profiteering. Well, PP prices during the pandemic went up five times and a lot of our competitors uh, were charging, as I said before, on the gowns front between seven and 12 pounds a gown. At the very start of the pandemic, the government paid actually numbers way in excess of that. Mm -hmm. We cut out most of the, um, the middle people and we dealt direct with the manufacturer. So you say you saved the government a lot of money, but you also made a lot of money. And there's nothing wrong with making money, but that is what happened, right? We made a good return for the risk involved, and the risk was considerable. But when it became public that you were connected to the company, you both denied it. Why? I wasn't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes, and I regret and I'm sorry for not saying straight out, yes, I am involved, because DHSC, the NHS, um, the Cabinet Office, they all knew of my involvement. But I didn't want the press intrusion for my family. My family have gone through hell with the media over you know, my career. And I didn't want another big hoo-ha in the press. Over a period of months, yeah. you said again and again mm -hmm. that you had no connection. And your lawyers even said to some journalists it would be defamatory, they'd be libelling you if they told the truth. You know, this just wasn't a slip up. Yeah. You didn't tell the truth for months on end. I think if end. we were to say of anything that we have done, we've done a lot of good, but if we were to say anything that we have done, that we are sorry for, and that's not, to, that's, we should have told the press straight up, straight away, yeah, nothing to hide. And again, I'm sorry for that, but I wasn't trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. No one. But that's exactly what you were trying to do. You had lawyers working for both of you, telling people, telling the public that you had nothing to do with the company. Yeah. And saying it would have been a libel to suggest that you were. Yeah, but it's something that we regret doing and we listen to our advisors. What happened then? to the money, the profit you've alluded to, around about £61 million. Pounds. Okay. So I led the consortium. Um, at the end of the day, I'm an Isle of Man resident. The money uh, comes to the Isle of Man because that's, that's fundamentally where I live. It goes on my tax return. And like all my sources of income that I've generated over many years, it goes into trust for the benefit of my family. Was any of it used to buy a yacht? No, no. Used to buy a what? A sorry? yacht. A yacht, it's not my yacht, it's not my money. I don't have that money and my kids don't have that money. And my children, my family have gone through so much pain because of the media, they have not got 29 million pounds. And this money from PP MedPro, as I understand it, went into two trusts. Yeah. Now, one of those trusts called Keristol. Yes. The beneficiaries of that trust, where half of the profit went, are you and your children? As and Doug's saying. children, and my children too. For the benefit of all my family. I'm his wife, so I'm a beneficiary as well as his children. 
as well as my children. You've said repeatedly you didn't financially benefit from this deal, except it's just a matter of time of when you benefit. Mm -hmm. It's my income, it's taxed on my tax return, and actually if I die one day in the future, she's going to directly benefit. As a family, you are benefiting from those tens of millions of pounds, whether it's today or in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years. For most people watching this, you did a deal with the government to provide more than 200 million pounds worth of PPE, and your family has made tens of millions of pounds no, from not that. My, my family hasn't, Laura, made tens of millions of pounds. God forbid if my husband decides to divorce me after the show <laughs> <laughs> and no, takes an me option. out of his letter of wishes, I take my husband out of my will if we, God forbid, get divorced. I don't benefit. It's my husband's money. It's his money. It's not my money and it's not my children's money. Michelle has no access to that money. Michelle has no discretion over that money. Unless I wanted to give everything away to uh, strangers or the charity or whatever, she was always going to benefit. And my family will benefit in due course. Her family benefit, my family benefit. That's what you do when you're in the privileged position of, of making money. We're yeah. not talking here about someone getting a Christmas bonus and saying, well, I'm not going to give it to my wife now. I'm going to put it in the bank and surprise her later on with sure. a lovely family holiday, or I'm sure. going to hold that money back because maybe one day we might be able to save deposit for the kid's flat further down the line. Yeah, sure. You've both admitted today that you will, in time, benefit financially from that cash. Your family as a unit will benefit from that cash. Why didn't you just be more straightforward about it? I am being straightforward about it now, Laura. I'm saying to you that I didn't receive that cash. That cash is not my cash. That cash is my husband's cash. But do you admit We are married. It's just like my mum and my dad going home with his wage, you know, packet on a Friday night and giving it to my mum. So she's, you know, benefiting from that as well. But that cash is not my cash. It's not my children's cash no. as the press and the attacks keep going on. Do you admit today that with the way that you've currently got your finances set up, that one day you and your children will benefit from that money because you right now are listed as the beneficiaries of that trust. If one day, if God forbid, my husband passes away before me, um, then I'm a beneficiary as well as his children and my children. So yes, of course. How would you describe the government's overall handling of trying to get PPE during that crisis from what you saw? And the reason why Doug and I are sitting here is because we've been their scapegoats goats, and they have destroyed our lives for over two years because it suited them, the narrative suits them to attack us the way they have done and the pain that's caused in our family and over, you know, I think the attacks, they go up all the time, um, over 700 threats, you know, I'm going to throw acid over you, I'm going to burn your house down and the hatred we've been absolutely vilified yeah. and you know we th we've only just we've done a one thing which was lie to the press to say we weren't involved no one deserves this so um doug let's then take you to a time when as far as you are concerned contracts have happened the deliveries have taken place the department of health then gets in touch says something's gone wrong. They tried to claw back money. Tell us what then happened. Our view is we supplied everything on time to specification and at competitive prices. We get to November 2022 and uh, I attend this negotiation uh, as opposed to a mediation and this individual asked me um, would I pay more for the other matter to go away. I was speechless, I didn't quite understand what he meant by that. Because the only other matter on the table was the NC investigation, which had commenced uh, in, as far as we were aware, in uh, April uh, 2022. Uh, I was absolutely gobsmacked. I'm clear in my mind what he was saying. He was asking me if I would pay more money for the uh, NCA 
investigation to be called off. It's an extraordinarily serious allegation to make. If that's what you believed was happening, why didn't you go to the police at that point? If you believed a senior government official was trying to bribe you to make a criminal investigation go away, why didn't you report it to the police then? I take the advice of my legal team uh, and the legal team at that point in time suggested that we, uh, we park that one for now. You've told us very candidly today, you led the consortium, yeah. you did the deal, and yet when you look up a company's house, which is where everything's meant to be registered in a normal way, you're nowhere to be seen. In, in terms of uh, <coughs> my appointments, um, they're all handled by the people in my family office. That's just normal practice and has been that way forever. I think some of our viewers though might feel there's a bit of a pattern. You know, at the beginning of this, the rules of the Lord say that your interest should be declared. You didn't, because you say the cabinet office told you not to. When it first emerged that you were behind PP MedPro, you didn't tell the truth about that. Doug, you led this consortium. You've made tens of millions of pounds out of it for your family, but your name's nowhere to be found on company's house when it comes to the business. And Michelle, you've said repeatedly you didn't benefit financially, except you've also admitted today that in time, your families may well benefit from huge amounts of money. There's a pattern here of time and again, trying to hide what really happened. I'm not here today to defend my record on why I am a private person and don't want anyone in the press to know of any business activity or anything I get engaged in. But Michelle, it does feel like the truth has had to be dragged out here. Not really, Laura, because no. the only thing I'd say to you is the only error that I have made is say to the press that I wasn't involved. But you repeatedly didn't tell the truth, whether it's the money, whether it's your involvement, whether it's whether you had to tell Parliament. It's a smokescreen. But that's why we're here today doing an interview But do you see why years. people listening might feel that? But that's why we're explaining yeah. to people. What do you hope that 2024 will bring for you, legally, for your reputations, and for you personally? I don't honestly see there's a case to answer. Um, I can't see what we've done wrong. Um, Doug and the consortium have simply delivered a contract, a delivery contract of goods. But after everything, you can't see what you've done wrong when you've admitted today that you lied to the press and That's by extension you lied to the public. Yeah, Laura, saying to the press not I'm not involved to protect my family, can I just make this clear? It's not a crime. The press have got nothing to do with my family. I was protecting my family. And I think people will realise that in the press attacks that I have gone through um, for the, since I walked into the House of Lords. I was a very successful individual businesswoman and since I walked into the House of Lords, it's been a nightmare for my family. So that's not a crime to say to the press, to, to tell you know, the press what I did. That's not a crime. Doug Barman, Michelle Moon, thank you so much for speaking thank to you. us today. Well, Oliver Dowden, the Deputy Prime Minister, joins us this morning. Welcome to the studio. Now, there is an ongoing criminal investigation into some aspects of this, so of course we must be very careful about what we say. But there are some straightforward questions on this I'd like to ask you. Michelle Moan says everyone in government knew of her links to PPE MedPro. Did you know? Uh, no, I didn't, but I should say at the very beginning of this that there is both a National Crime Agency investigation and the Department of Health is engaged in civil litigation with the company concerned. So I do need to be very careful about what I say as a minister, not to prejudice which, what is exactly the right approach to this, that this is being pursued through appropriate legal channels, both criminal and civil litigation. But you didn't know, but just there is on the record, one of your colleagues who was a health minister during the pandemic, Edward Argar, has said on the record that the link between them and the government was known before the contract was awarded. So you're not denying that parts of government were aware of it? Well, I, I haven't seen exactly what Minister Arga said in respect of that, 
but again, the, the, we have to be very careful with this, that, that we respect what is an ongoing legal process. But I, I, I've set the position out in respect to myself. Yes. Absolutely. One of their contentions is that they believe they've been scapegoated. Now, Michelle Moon says the whole approach to PPE was a shambles in a broader sense. There are lots of companies that provided PPE that was never used, and they're not being sued, and they are. So do you think they might have a point? No, I don't think they, they've got a point. First of all, it's worth remembering just going back to where we were uh, at the height of the COVID crisis. And indeed, I did many interviews uh, like this, and indeed with uh, Susanna Reid, who is one of your, your guests today, but people were constantly pressing the government, when are we going to get more of this equipment? And indeed, the opposition was saying, go for costumers, football players, a any, anyone to get this equipment in. So of course we had a drive to get, uh, uh, to get PP in as rapidly as we could. But uh, there were proper checks undertaken. There was proper due diligence uh, undertaken. Now, of course, with any large allocation of um, government funds for, for large-scale procurement, there are going to be issues that arise subsequently. But what I would say is that in respect of this, you can see there is civil litigation happening. You can see there's a criminal investigation happening. So if there is fraud, the government will crack down on it. But we're it. talking about the broader issue here. I mean, if you're confident all the checks and balances were followed, then why are there so much PPE from so many different companies that was never used? Why was £9 billion wasted if all the correct checks and balances were carried out? Well, there's this wider point about the scale of the PPE that was ordered. And what the government was doing was working against what we describe in government as the reasonable worst case scenario. So in a rapidly moving situation, and remember, again, going back to the height of COVID, countries around the world were trying to grapple with where this was going. So we made sure that we ordered large amounts of PPE in order to to meet the reasonable worst case scenario. Now, thankfully, that didn't transpire. So it did mean that we had more PPE than was required. But I think that that was the correct balance for the government to, to get in this situation. But are you proud that you ended up with nine billion pounds wasted? Well, first of all, I would dispute the, the, the waste number. But the overall principle that we ordered to the reasonable worst case scenario, mm -hmm. I think is what your viewers would expect us to do, to make sure if we didn't know quite where this virus is going, just like other countries around the world, we made sure that we got the maximum amount available. And that's exactly what we did. Some experts would say, actually, you had to order in such a panic like that because the government wasn't properly prepared at the beginning. But I want to address a different element of this, though, is where people with political connections were able to be fast forwarded in what was known as the VIP lane. Now, there were a number of Conservative politicians who were the sources of referrals into that VIP lane for people who then did get commercial contracts. That has created claims of cronyism on quite a broad scale. On reflection, would it have been better not to use that approach? Because it has left you open and other Conservative politicians open to claims of cronyism that basically contracts for PPE were being doled out to the government's mates. Well, what I should say, first of all, that is categorically not the case. In terms of the, the perception point, of course, one can always look back with hindsight on these things. But, but it's important. But what I, what I would say in, in respect of this was the government's intention in respect of that was to make sure that if legitimate claims came forward, uh, we process them quickly. There, was, there were no favours or special treatment. Everyone had ultimately the same test applied to them. And indeed, if it is the case where... Uh, allegations of, of fraud and misconduct have, have occurred. There's either the civil or, civil or criminal, which you can see going on in respect of the, the interview that you've just broadcast. In addition to that, we set up the Public Sector Fraud Authority, which already in mm -hmm. its first year has recovered double its initial target. And we've recovered specifically uh, over £130 million worth of fraud. And that's that's what we're doing uh, already, and of course there'll be more to come through the pipeline. So you think there will, will be more money coming back to the taxpayer for contracts that uh, went wrong? If there has if we have had contracts uh, where there has been fraud, we won't cease until we've recovered all the sums we can, just as we do with tax fraud and, and any other fraud against the government. These things don't happen immediately, but we're taking the steps. And indeed, if you look at this case, you can see how it does quite, take quite a long time between commencing legal action and, uh, and the, the, the sums being recovered. But I can assure your viewers, and I can assure you, we will go after every example of fraud. I just want to ask you one specific thing on this. You'll have heard there Doug Barrowman make a claim that a government official suggested he pay a sum of money to make a criminal investigation go away. Does that concern you to hear that? Well, uh, I simply don't recognise that. But again, uh, th let's wait and see. There is, there's, a, there's a proper process for this to, to, to go through, but in a broad which, sense, is, which is in relation to a civil case 
and a, a, a criminal case. We will get to the bottom of exactly what happened, and, and I think that's, that's the right way to proceed. But as the second most senior person in the government, are you confident that that kind of thing doesn't happen on your watch? I, I am confident, and I would be very surprised, but that I, I don't want to, to prejudge uh, matters that, that are, are, are a matter for the I, courts. I quite understand. Um, the Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, on a different subject, seems to have changed the government's tone towards what's happening in Israel and Gaza. Now, we know the UK has been given very strong support as an ally to Israel, but now he says there must be a sustainable ceasefire. What does that mean? Well, in order for a ceasefire to be sustainable, we have to ensure that we remove the threat of Hamas from Israel and indeed the wider Middle East. And you saw what happened on that terrible day on the 7th mm -hmm. of October when Hamas were able to penetrate the, the border of Israel and indiscriminately murder 1,400 men, women and children. And until we deal with that, any ceasefire will not ultimately be sustainable. So that's why we continue to support Israel in its right to self-defense to remove the threat of Hamas and at the same time to get those hostages back. But what those does a, are the two things that ensure that we have a sustainable ceasefire. But what does a sustainable ceasefire mean then? Because essentially what you've said, there is the UK government position all along. Israel must be allowed to, to deal with Hamas as they wish. But this, there has been a shift. David Cameron is now explicitly saying Israel has killed too many people in Gaza. That's not something the government was saying just a few weeks ago. So what's changed? Where did they cross the line? Well, the first thing I would say is, that, and I think the point that the, the Foreign Secretary is making, indeed I know it's the case that he's, he's making and I have uh, discussed it, is the, the difference between those calling for a ceasefire now and the position of the UK government is uh, that ceasefire can't be sustainable till we've dealt with Hamas. Now, in respect to the conflict that's going on in Gaza uh, right now, we always knew this would be a difficult conflict. Hamas hides itself amongst the civilian population. It makes it very difficult for the IDF to, to go after them. But nonetheless, we do continue to urge restraint, abiding with international law. And at the same time, on this wider ceasefire point, we're trying to ensure that we get as long a period of pauses in hostility to allow that aid in. So, for example, we've got £87 million pounds worth but of aid. But do you think Israel has in. gone too far? Is that what's behind this change in tone? Uh, I, I wouldn't characterise it uh, as Israel going uh, too far, Israel is dealing with a very difficult situation. I think it's really important for, for your viewers to, to remember this, not only the scale of the atrocity that was committed against Israel, but if you're going after an enemy that literally hides underneath hospitals, hides amongst the civilian population, you are going to sustain high levels of civilian casualties. What we as a UK government are saying is, uh, Israel, you do need to exercise restraint. And by the way, we were also making sure in terms of getting those hostages out, that we support, uh, whether that's in relation to intelligence uh, from, uh, from RAF planes and so on. We're, we're supporting Israel in its wider effort to make sure we, we, we get the hostages out. And just finally, we asked you a few weeks ago about any British hostages. Is there anything else you can update us on that? Um, I'm, I'm afraid I can't provide a, a, a further update other than to say that we continue to work very closely with uh, the, the Israelis to make sure that those remaining British hostages uh, we, we release as soon as we possibly can. OK, you'll understand why we asked that question, but we quite understand the delicate situation of it. Oliver Dowd, and thank you very much indeed for coming in today. It's always good to have you in the studio. So what did you think of what he had to say and what Michelle Moan and Doug Barrowman had to say in their extended interview with us? You can send me an email coonsberg at bbc.co.uk or use the hashtag on social media BBC Laura Kay if you're that way inclined and towards the end of the programme we will bring you some of what your fellow viewers had to say. So let's have a stock take with our panel. Susanna, when you were watching that interview with Michelle Moan, what was going through your mind? Um, that she thinks that she's the victim because of the press intrusion. Now, I have enormous sympathy um, because press intrusion can be very uncomfortable, but there is a reason for press intrusion, and that is because there is an allegation of wrongdoing. And um, I just think it's utterly remarkable that she doesn't see how sensitive this issue is for people. PPE was so desperately needed that business people thought that they could make tens of millions of pounds out of that desperation. And she was a member, is a member of the House of Lords and a public servant, you know, member of our parliament. And I, I don't really see that she understands 
what the, the problem is here, that people are genuinely upset. You know, we went through an absolutely devastating pandemic. Mm. Hospitals suffered, care homes suffered, mm. people lost members of their family. There are people who are permanently disabled by COVID. Our mm. children's education was shattered. Nobody wants to see anybody profiteering from this crisis. Robert, what did you make of it? Because at the same time, she would argue, other business people might argue, well, PP wasn't free, it wasn't going to grow on trees. But mm. what did you make of their explanations? Well, look, there's going to be a cost to this. But I think what really came across was her failure to understand that as a member of the House of Lords, it's your responsibility to mm. register interests. You know, the, the government isn't going to tell you what to do. You know, as an MP and as a minister, I had to uh, think of both the ministerial interests and the Commons uh, register. There's a code of conduct that everybody should uh, understand and read, and you follow that, because when you're in the House of Lords, it's not just like a, a bauble or a title, it's a public role but she and that I think was quite striking. She claimed though that everyone in the government knew. Did you know you were in the government at the time? I, I did not know. Uh, I, obviously we'd had approaches in, in the MOJ about PPE but the questions that my officials and I were always asking is look is this bona fide? A lot of these companies coming forward actually didn't have any PPE. They were saying that they could get PPE so which, in, for an which initially you know, absolutely raised alarm bells with the likes of me you know because we want to know exactly where it was coming mm. from and who was making it you know at one point we even had prisoners making PPE because it was part of the the national mm. effort you know we got this feeling that we want mm. we were all in this together and we wanted to do the best and for, for any perception that people were trying to take advantage of that goodwill is I think deeply concerning Brian what did you think well she did have a, a telephone conversation with Michael Gove uh, which was uh, about what she could do or what they could do mm. I just think that in times of a major crisis like we had with COVID, to take advantage of a situation like that, there's something obscene about it as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I think that you have, to be, you have to behave with utmost scrutiny. And there wasn't enough scrutiny in this case, I don't think, at all, which has led to her being in the situation and him, her husband, being in the situation they are. So I find that the lack of scrutiny in the government in mm. dealing with this is what's questionable. Uh, and I think that should have been looked at. You know, when there's a major crisis, naturally people are looking to the advantage of making money out of mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. That's a kind of instinctive thing, mm -hmm. but it's wrong and it should be curbed. Is there a case though, Robert, actually with the government trying to go mm. fast in the panic did make actually lots of mistakes. Mm. They were willing, you were willing to break the normal rules. And actually one official who was an official at the mm. time is not now, but from the cabinet office said to me a few days ago, we basically broke the rules for the vaccine and it was a great success. We broke the rules on procurement of PPE and it was a disaster. I mean, is that a fair assessment? Look, I think this was an extraordinary time. I mean, wartime is an exceptional period for government. This was the biggest peacetime challenge any government had ever faced. We were flying a plane at night without a manual or without an autopilot, trying to work out what was in the best interest of the people we were serving. Yes, mistakes were made, but I think overall, you know, we were in the same boat as other governments, trying our very best to navigate navigate a way through and save lives. Except as the COVID inquiry is now revealing, we didn't have someone at the helm who took it seriously right at the beginning. We had exactly. a prime minister who failed to exactly. attend five Precisely. COBRA meetings right at the beginning. You know, there were indications that this was going to be extremely serious and we needed to get prepared. Right at the beginning of the year, we should never have been in a situation where we were so badly prepared for what was coming. And, you know, this is on the government that we just didn't have the stuff in place that was needed. Of course, you know, we can acknowledge that perhaps it, it came thicker and faster, mm -hmm. but we had the indications and mm. we should have had a prime minister who was there and not finishing off a biography of Shakespeare at the time. Well, the COVID inquiry has been one of the big events of this last year. I just want to give you a brief reminder of some of the other things that have gone on in 2023. Five promises. Five missions. Why won't you tell us whether or not you use private health care? But, but, but again, it's a, it's a distraction from what the real issue is. I think Australia will become a republic at you some do. point. It feels natural. Jacinda Ardern said she doesn't have enough in the tank to continue. How much is in the Nicola Sturgeon's There's tank? There's plenty in the tank uh, at the moment. 
And so today I am announcing my intention to step down as First Minister. The Prime Minister's made the key pledge to stop the boats. It's going to be pretty obvious uh, when we've uh, succeeded in achieving that. We're having fantastic results across the country. Plymouth, what a night they've had in Plymouth. Always disappointing to lose hard-working Conservative councillors. If I told you that you would cut the Mona Lisa in half, and you would have half of it at the Louvre and half of it at the British Museum. Do you think your viewers would appreciate the, the, the beauty of the painting? We ended up with the king, I'm sure completely by accident, wearing a tie with the Greek flag on it. There it is, the Greek flag. I mean, if he was trying to make a point, if he was trying to make a point, he could, he could hardly have been clearer. I think he was just trying to bring out the blue in his eyes. <laughs> in the King's eyes. Perhaps that's what he was up to. Um, Robert Buckland, it has not been a good year for your party, has it? You know, in January, Rishi Sunak thought, oh, maybe I can turn it around, and it doesn't look like it, does it? Well, look, it, it, it's a very tough year for a governing party 13 years into the, the, a period of office. Um, the Prime Minister was right in his priorities at the beginning of the year, and progress has been made on the most important one, that is tackling inflation, which affects all of our lives. Uh, there's a long way to go on, on the other key pledges. But you've ended but the year he's having, the sort of you person know, who does put his shoulder to the wheel. But you've and ended he's a, he's the year in another week of chaos and infighting over migration. I mean, it, you know, yet again, the Tories are in a position where we can see your splits and spats from space. Well, look, I think that talking about the issue is the right thing to do because millions of people are concerned about the challenge that we and indeed the West face from mass migration. Well, you're not and just we've talking about the issue. I mean, you're all well, screaming and shouting each other well, about I the issue. Well, I'm not screaming and shouting. I mean, I have disagreements I'm sure you never with... Would. Well, you know, I get pretty strong. I'm a passionate Welshman, but I do think that, you know, to ignore the issue would be to, to fail uh, the public. Brian, I know you've been watching this issue carefully. Mm-hmm. I just find it extraordinary, you know, that successive governments, and I don't, either Tory or Labour, have not exercised duty of care. They don't really look to what our responsibility is in terms of the world. So, for instance, the Rwanda crisis. I find it extraordinary, really, that, uh, that we, um, we want to ship these people away, but we don't examine why are these people here? Why do they make that? What has been the situation that has turned the world upside down and made these people want to seek a better life elsewhere? Now, of course, there's the illegal aspect of that. Of course, there's the people who will jump on that particular bandwagon. But at the same time, to say, well, let's send them to Rwanda. Now, actually, Rwanda might be a better situation than our situation, in fact. It could be. But at the same time, what I find extraordinary is that we don't actually have the duty of care. It's also what's happened with these, wonder, these extraordinary uh, soldiers, uh, the army in, 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 in Afghanistan. In, in Afghanistan. Mm. The same thing has happened. Susanna, it's difficult, though, for politicians, isn't it? Because the public does have concerns about high levels of migration. Mm. And yet there are also lots of voters who've got concerns like Brian, or even lots of people who hold both of those feelings. Mm. The irony is that Rishi Sunak has staked his reputation on something he doesn't seem to be able to do, which is to stop the boats. And it's the tiniest proportion of immigration. Net migration under this government has gone up to over 700,000. And mm. this is under an original Conservative Prime Minister who said he wanted to bring migration down to the tens, tens of, of thousands. thousands. I mean, I think the greatest achievement for the government this year is that they've managed to get through the year with just the one Prime Minister. Although, of course, we've still got um, a couple of weeks left. <laughs> well, you never know. And who knows what will happen in 2024. We will be checking in with you in a few minutes. I want you to have a little think about getting your dancing shoes on because mm -hmm. we're going to be talking about last night strictly. Oh, Although there won't memory. necessarily be any actual dancing in the studio, but you never know. Now, for Labour, it's been a year of steady progress. They are still ahead in the polls, and you can see an increasing confidence that the party might be on its way back to power, although a lot could happen between now and the election. There are still gaps in its plans, tensions ahead, and how would they balance the books? Well, Wes Streeting wants to be Labour's next health secretary, and he is with us this morning. Welcome to the studio, Wes. Good morning. Let's just go back to our interview with Michelle, Michelle Moan uh, briefly. She says that she has been made a scapegoat for a wider government shambles. Do you agree with that? I, I must say, I, I don't know who thought it was a good idea for her to do that interview, but I don't think anyone watching will be shedding any tears. She lied about her own involvement in a serious contract and, you know, recognise 
that there's an ongoing criminal investigation, so be careful about what I say, mm -hmm. but there's a fundamental point of principle here, which is in the midst of a deadly pandemic, when so many people rush to help others mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways, from you know, helping their neighbours, going to work even though it was dangerous, particularly those people working in the NHS, mm -hmm. there were so many people who rushed to do the right thing and then there were others who saw the pandemic as an opportunity to make a quick buck at someone else's expense. And our message to those people who sought to use the pandemic to get rich quick, we want our money back. And with a Labour government, we will appoint a COVID corruption commissioner, giving them the powers they need to claw back as much of that money as possible. Because £8 billion, mm. £8 billion was lost through fraud, £15 billion in unusable PPE. Taken together, that could have funded the 40 new hospitals but, the but government Oliver hasn't Downton delivered. But Oliver told us a few minutes ago that actually the government was already doing that. They're already looking at cases of fraud. They're already scraping money back. So why do you have to invent a new commissioner? Sounds a bit like you it's, just wanted to get a good headline so, no, out of it. No, I think it's been, I, I think the government's uh, response has been appalling. A and the extent to which they've been able to claw money back has been pathetic. And I think Rishi Sunak should take this personally and, and, and grip it. After all, it's his name on all of those checks. He was the chancellor mm. who was splashing the cash. And where people have been found to be ripping off our country at a time when our public services are stretched and those billions of pounds would be much better spent in the pockets of families that are struggling, mm -hmm. I think this should be a much higher priority for the government. And I don't understand why they have taken such a casual approach to this, apart from the fact we know that there are many people who are friends and donors to the Conservative Party who've done quite well out of this pandemic. Well, a lot of them are not here to defend themselves and they would say they were trying to provide things at a time of national need. But we well, don't worry, we'll say. find them. You'll fi well, that's interesting though. So you really want to make a big play of this and make it part of Labour's opposite, uh, offer at the next election, the, the getting money back the, the, from the, COVID. The fact is that people ripped our country off and we have to get our money back and also send a signal to people in the future that you don't get away with this. And, and, you know, I'm sure we'll come on to talk about this in the context of the NHS, but it also applies to mm -hmm. the broader public services. Money is tight in this country. Mm -hmm. The public finances are a disaster, thanks to this government. And families are really feeling the pinch this Christmas. Not just the people at the sharpest end, but even those families who would have previously thought themselves to be fairly OK, able to afford family trips out, able to afford the holiday. With rising bills, rising rents, rising mortgages and rising taxes, people are really feeling the pinch. Let's and that's why we've got a responsibility to get that money well, back. Well, let's talk about the health service then. Now, you said this week that every winter crisis and every challenge it faces, the NHS uses it as an excuse to ask for more money. Who does? The NHS bosses, doctors, nurses? Who uses it as an excuse? Well, I certainly think that, you know, whenever a challenge comes along, there is always a case being made for extra money. And, and I, I understand that. But by who? But money this is, is important. Who well, are you by, pointing the finger at? By, by, by NHS leaders, by, 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 you know, senior managers working across the system. And I understand why. I understand the pressures they're under. And I understand why that there is always a case being made for additional investment. But there are there's two big challenges. One is because the public finances are an absolute disaster, the idea that we're going to be able to come in after the next election and just turn the taps on, there'll be loads of money to go around. If you it win. Is just It's far of the mark, as I say, after the election, if there's a Labour government. The, the, the second challenge um, is this. There are plenty of examples where the NHS does not spend money as effectively as it could. And every penny that we put into the NHS comes at the expense of other worthy causes, whether child poverty reduction, spending mm. in schools, crime and policing, or putting money back into the pockets of hard-pressed families. You and so, you know, whether it's the, you know, more than three billion pounds we spend on agency costs because of a lack of proper workforce planning, or the fact that because people can't get a GP appointment, despite the fact GPs are providing a million more what appointments now they did before what do you the think, pandemic. West, West, what do you Let think me just finish it does, no, no, I want 40, to ask you another question because you've GP given a very long answer. Versus four, 400 but, but, but pounds to go think, to A&E, that could be better spent. What do you think it does though for NHS staff morale, nurses who've just finished a long shift have maybe put the telly on this morning when they got home, when you're sitting there saying the NHS makes its excuses to ask for more money, what do you think that does for their morale? But the reason I, the reason I criticise 
some of the challenges in the NHS is, is, is partly to show the staff of the NHS we've noticed what they've been telling me. I've sat mm. in GP surgeries, shadowing GPs, looking over their shoulder at the outdated technology they use, using and the huge number of accountability measures they have that tie them up in red tape that they'd rather be spending with their patients. And because of that, I've said we'll reform the accountability for GPs to give them more time with patients so we can bring back the family doctors. And, Similarly, and the nurses on the wards will tell you and reform, they see reform inefficiency can be very, in the system reform, and they're frustrated. And reform can be very, very expensive. But I want to uh, just ask you briefly, and we ask you this every time you come on the programme, where is your plan for social care? Because what a lot of people say in the NHS is you can't solve any of the big problems until there's a coherent social care plan. And they're right. One in nine people are currently in hospital beds when they so don't need to be. So where's so your plan? So when I was last on your programme I said we would we would say some things at conference we committed to a 10-year plan for social care alongside the NHS proper workforce planning and social care including new fair pay agreements so that we can improve the pay the career progression for care workers but there is more to come well you know that back in the new year to talk are you about you're going to give us a date of um, when you're going to tell people I'll, what you well, do we'll be back in the new year to, to set out um, our, our long-term approach to social care because I, I, I take the challenge mm -hmm. the reason why I'm taking my time on social care is because it's big it's complicated and we've had a total failure of bad politics over more than a decade now and I don't want to repeat those mistakes we have got to get it right okay. because there are millions of people who rely on good social care and at the moment don't receive it but okay. I promise I'll come back. You do promise well our viewers have heard you promise that you will come back with that plan in the new year we hope you bring it to us here first it's always good to have you in the I'll studio. Keep that in mind. Thank you Cheers, for being Laura. here this morning. Right, let's go back to our main story this morning, our interview with Baroness Moan and her husband, Doug Barrowman, who after repeated denials over a very long time, have now apologised for lying about a PPE deal worth millions of pounds. I don't honestly see there's a case to answer. Um, I can't see what we've done wrong. Um, Doug and the consortium have simply delivered a contract Well, it's going to be very interesting to see the reaction to that interview. We've had some interesting conversations about it this morning in the studio. We'll see how it develops in the next few hours. But I want to close our programme with something a bit more fun, a bit more lighthearted. It was the Strictly final last night. Oh, no. Susanna, what's it like for you watching it, having been in it and nearly yeah. won it a ten, few years ago? Ten years on. It's ten years? Yeah, and huge congratulations to the winners. If you haven't seen, I don't... Are we doing a <laughs> Oh, we're showing the pictures now. Oh, we're there showing we the are. pictures Sorry, everybody, if you haven't seen it. Oh, it's really absolutely <laughs> terrific. And in fact, my partner, Kevin Clifton, five years after this, um, or a couple of years after this, he then went on to win it with Stacey Dooley. So it's, um, it's, it's the most magical, sparkling, fantastic experience to be involved in. It is not real life. So I have That's to say shame, to isn't it? any of any of <laughs> those contestants who wake up this morning, they will come back down to earth with a bump because it's like a completely different planet where you breathe air, which is sequin encrusted. <laughs> Brian, do you ever fancy it? I've actually been asked to be on it. Have you? And have and you said I, yes for 2024? I, no, I declined. Why? Well, there's a sort of, uh, I mean, I like dancing. Uh, don't get me wrong. I just don't, I don't want to, I don't know why, but I just, um, I always see there's, there's a sort of joke element in it. You know, there's so always the character that's, you well, know, sort of that, panto. You, that, that's going to be getting the elbow at a very <laughs> early age. And I just thought, I don't know if I want to go down that road. <laughs> Could you be persuaded, though, one day if they got mm, back on the phone? I, I'm getting too old for it anyway. Oh, <laughs> never too old. Come on, Robert, what about you? Are you a secret twinkle toes? Oh, I love dancing. Oh, what absolutely kind of dancing? Yeah, well, I like Charleston. I can do a little <laughs> bit of ballroom. Yeah, yeah, and I absolutely adore dancing. And I, that show means so much to me and my family. My daughter loves oh, it. Love it's love it's part of our lives every every autumn season. So we're going to miss it now no, it's off. It sounds a bit like you quite fancy it. I mean, there well, are politicians, who, former politicians, who've gone it, but well, one or Ed, Ed Balls did, a, did very well. As you reminded me the other day, he got, I think, right beyond Blackpool. So he did very he did well. A phenomenal Gangnam style. Yeah. Mm. We all remember seeing that. What do you think, um, Robert, of uh, Nigel Farage being in the jungle? I mean, is it healthy for politicians to go off and do these celebrity style things? Well, I mean, he, he's not a serving politician. And I think there is a difference if you're serving in office, you know, jetting across the world. I don't think well, it's Well, your colleague Johnny Mercer, do. who's a minister in the government, is apparently filming some reality show the other day. 
Oh, well, I, I, that's the first I knew about that. Um, interesting. Um, I always thought as a serving minister, you're a little bit tied by the red box and all the work that you had to do. But uh, you know, I think I think there's no reason why politicians can't show the other side of life. You know, it's boring just doing politics. There's many other things to enjoy in life, like music and dance, which I love, sport, all those things that I care about that I think probably make me a slightly better politician rather than just breathing politics all and the time. And Susanna, just briefly, you had uh, Nigel Farage's interview after he emerged from the jungle. How did you find him? Oh, he's in combative mode, <laughs> as usual. Um, I just wonder whether you think he's going to come back into the Conservative Party. Well, that would be interesting. Nigel and Farage me in the, and me in the same party. Mm, can't see that really working. What, so if Nigel Farage did come back, others would leave, you think? Well, it's, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. He can do his own thing. <laughs> <laughs> All three of you, thank you so much for being with us this morning. It's been really interesting and great fun at the end. A huge thank you to Susanna, Brian and Robert. You can watch a longer version of our interview with Michelle Moan and Doug Barrowman on the iPlayer now or listen on newscast on BBC Sounds. And whether you fancy a tango, a foxtrot or just sitting on the sofa with a tub of Quality Street tonight, that is just about it from us for 2023. We will be back on the 7th of January with the first show of what will in all likelihood be the year of the next general election. And every Sunday in 2024, we will hear from those who want to persuade you to give them your votes and we will put them to the test week in, week out. In a few minutes, I'll be with Paddy O'Connell for Sunday's newscast. There he is with a festive wave. Well done, Paddy. I was slightly hoping you'd have a Santa hat on, but that's very festive and jolly. But I want to thank you warmly for watching and spending your Sunday mornings with us. And as you know by now, every now and then on special occasions, we like to bring you something that is just unashamedly gorgeous. So to say goodbye from us all, the very gorgeous singer Gregory Porter. Here he is with Do You Hear What I Hear from his album, A Christmas Wish. And I wish all of you a very Merry Christmas. Said the shepherd boy to the mighty king, do you know what I In your palace warm, mighty king Do you know what I know? Do you know what I know? A child, a child Shivers in the cold Let us bring him silver and gold Let us bring him silver and gold said the mighty king to the people everywhere listen to what I say listen to what I say pray for peace people everywhere Listen to what I say. Listen to what I say. The child, the child, sleeping in the night, he will bring us goodness and light. He will bring us goodness and light.